And then this is something else the Lord began to say. We'll land the plane here, sort of. For this is a season of great divine purpose for my people. The scrolls of that which I have desired from the beginning of time for this distinct period and purpose for the earth are open. And I want you to know that they're full of grace, full of abundance, full of miracles, full of provision. Of, of provision excuse me. For though the kingdoms and the entities of this world will continue to shake, my people must not be shaken. For they must have a must, must excuse me. For they must have a clear and distinct focus. For when you keep your focus upon me, I, you see as I desire to, you to see, and you have the ability to apprehend that which I've made available to my people, and know that which I've made available to my people is clean and pure, and I desire it to endure for eternity. You know what I found helps keep your focus is your purpose. Everyone on earth comes to earth with a purpose. The beauty of God, and we touched a little bit on this subject last night, we know one of the aspects of God is that He is eternal. Meaning He's eternally existing. And He thought about you before the very foundation of the earth. So the thought is this. If God is eternal and He thought about you before the foundation of the earth, perhaps in God's mind you've been around forever. That's a beautiful thought. So he thought about you, and part of how he thought about you is his purpose. And there's a unique purpose on every person in this room. There's a unique reason. And by the way, this is the shortest part of your purpose. The Bible teaches us your life is but a vapor. That's why it says, don't store up things here on the earth. Store up things in heaven. Purpose means the reason for which something exists, an intended result, an aim, a goal, a determination, resoluteness. That's why revelation is so important. Because revelation, your purpose can only come by revelation. Jesus said this. He was the model son. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He, uh, he could only understand his purpose by revelation. True purpose can only be understood by revelation. For new believers, for people who have just come into these things, I have found if you will practice what it simply has already said in the Word, you will discover your purpose. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Practice the Word of God. Seek to be a person of authority. Pray for the sick. Lay hands on the sick. Be part of a community of people. Be open for feedback. I've never found anyone who does those biblical things. You might not have it all figured out, but you know there is a place that God is taking you. Your purpose should drive you every day. And it also defines the boundaries of the focus of your life. I don't, this might be, you know, you might disagree with me, but I'm right. I don't believe in a balanced life. If I decide I'm going to run a marathon in two months, I only have 24 hours. Your time is a currency. I don't like wasting time. I only have 24 hours in a day. There is some part of my day that is now going to be taken up to train for that. So something else has to not exist anymore. But I'll tell you this. I, have, I can tell you with no exaggeration, I've never regretted saying yes to the Lord. I've never regretted an hour in His presence. I've never regretted talking to God. I've never regretted time in His Word. I've never regretted coming to a meeting. I have regretted when I missed the meeting. Amen. Never regretted. All these years later, I've, I never thought I missed out on anything in college. I'd spend my Saturday nights in prayer meetings. Like, you should really have some fun. This is fun. One of the reasons God gives you purpose is so that you would live a life of great intentionality. 
foundations and discipline allow you to live your purpose long term. Foundations, it's the, it's the basis. So define, if you have never done it, take time to define your core values. What is going to define your life? I revisit all my core values every year. What defines my life in this season? What are the choices I made? It doesn't matter if, if, I, if this falls by the wayside in the ministry, if this falls by the wayside, it doesn't matter if we don't accomplish that. If as long as I have put God first place, the word and worship and prayer, that is what will get done. And you know what? All the other stuff gets done. Some of you, even today, you've made an effort to come here. You have a bunch of things going on. But I guarantee you, just like when you give an offering, God will reward the time back to you. I've had times where I got all these things. I just stop and pray. I'm going, no, no, I'm busy working for you. Take the 20 minutes. Boom, I get more revelation. Redeem the time for the days are evil. So true purpose only comes by revelation. Purpose is exclusive to you. You were born in original. Don't ever think what you have come to earth to do is not important. See, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 49, see, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. It's how important you are to God. This is one thing, a value my parents taught me as a little kid. I'm very thankful for this value. My dad used to sit with me. You can do anything that God has called you to do. As long as you say yes and you're willing to work hard. That's another thing. We need to make working hard in America again. Popular. Lord Jesus, you go to restaurants, we don't have any help. I got some people who can help you. There may be people who have similar ministries, but they can't teach like Abner can. It's not an arrogant thing, it's just I know. I've gleaned from Many people, I have mentors and fathers in my life, but I've never wanted to be them. Never strive to be anyone else. Be an original. Be a voice, not an echo. You can, we all will incorporate things from different people who influence us. You can hear my grandfather and my teaching, but be the original that God has created you to be. True discipleship is not a bunch of people trying to preach like the pastor. True discipleship is discovering who you are in God and taking the equipping grace on that man or woman of God and adding it to the purposes of God in your life. Purpose can only be fulfilled by faith. I love Joseph and David. Actually, uh, let's read 1 Samuel 16. Oh, it's gotten... Still with me? I'm just sharing again from the heart. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming. And he said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons, invited them to sacrifice. So it was, when they came, he looked at Eliab and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord says, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I always think those verses are really Pentecostal. For the Lord does not see. That's how I read that verse. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord. Happy New Year, everyone. But the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so Jesse called Abinadab and made him sit down before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. There he is keeping sheep. And Samuel said, send him and bring him here, for we will not sit down till he comes. Then he sent and brought him here. And he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. My Bible says like Abner. It's a very limited translation though. And the Lord said, 
Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. I don't know if you have that in your version. Dr. Walter, you have that in your version? Is it in your? It's, it's in yours? Yeah, I thought so. And the Lord took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. I read this, and you can read first. Uh, you can read Genesis 37 constantly in Scripture. When God reveals part of people's purpose, it's never possible unless God does it. There's no school he can go to. There's no training he can go to. And I even think David's like, you know, he's harp. He's like, okay, you know, like if you thought, you know, thought like me, you're like, okay, I'm an intern in Saul's house. He's eventually going to recognize I got the call of God. He's going to mentor me. No, he's going to kill him. There is no way he can fulfill what God told him unless God would bring it to pass. Listen to me, Linda. There is no way you can really do the things that God has called you to do unless God would bring it to pass. So you will need faith and you'll also have to embrace process. You also never need to give up on what God has said. But here's the thing. Usually in process, you will no longer be defined by reaching that destination, but by being like Him. But when you become like Him, you'll reach the destination. Because that's the real goal of discipleship. Good encouraging thing is it is not your responsibility to bring your purpose to pass. It's your responsibility to believe it will come to pass. But then it's those little moments are met in things that don't seem to make sense to you. You're like, I'm, you know, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to do this, and and God is like talking to you about helping like your your neighbor. You're like, no, I'm called to be a prophet to the nations. He's like, help your neighbor. But I want to go teach Sunday school. Help your neighbor in this season. No, help your neighbor. You're like, you're trying to help God out. I don't want to go to the conference and then blow the shofar on me and put oil and all that. No, help your neighbor. I remember one of the reasons I really didn't want to give everything to the Lord as a little kid is I didn't want to go to Africa. I'm serious, because I mean, the pictures I saw of Africa, I don't know if you grew up like me, they put in these you know, tapes and pictures they're like, Here's the children of Africa, and like they've got flies on them, and you know, like so you can feed those. Like they got no running water, no way. No, I'm American. <laughs> I'm a very honest person. I told the Lord that. So then, when I surrendered my life to the Lord, He told me, you know, you're gonna you have this call to the nations, and we give you authority to govern the na- nations. And so I'm like, I'm ready to go to Africa now. And He goes, Forgive your dad. No, no, I'm ready to go to Africa. You got a bad attitude against that professor. No, no, go to Africa. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Because he's building the inside. It's not an intellectual journey with God. God is also going to move people to different geographic locations for them to be positioned properly. I just felt that. True purpose necessitates process. Now this is a big one. Purpose is always for service to God and therefore humanity. The point was not Joseph being prime minister of a nation. The point was God to be faithful to his word. So individual purpose always intersects with God's larger purpose for the earth. That's why it's so important to serve your generation. I was thinking about this like four weeks ago before I was about to minister. There's a man, Dr. Hunt, when I was at Campbell University. So I don't even remember who this person was. He's like, there's going to be this young guy preaching at tonight. I think you'd really enjoy it. The Lord showed me years later is because my mom was praying me that I went to the meeting. You're backslidden. You usually don't choose to go to meetings on your own. 
quiet with that one. But, so I'm in the back of the auditorium because that's what you do when you're backslidden. I still remember. I taught this message on young people our age who would preach the gospel in a Muslim nation. And they would beat them with rods and they would throw them out. They'd come back again and preach the gospel. I remember in this back of the auditorium, I'm thinking, I love God, but I definitely don't love him to do that. Who would want to do that? But I had this sense that night. It wasn't like anything, like I couldn't move out of my seat. Just this thought. I believe God just gave me a thought and he didn't arrest me that night because I, I, I'd been around the things of God so much. I believe God was just saying, you can choose what you want right now. To whom much is given, much is required. And I'm in the back of this auditorium and I thought, I have this thought that somehow if I don't make a choice to surrender to God tonight, somehow my life is not going to turn out how God wants it to be. And I always live with this sense, probably my parents too, I always live with this sense that my life was supposed to be really, really significant. Some people have jokingly told me, your parents really loved you. They did. Your parents should love you too. They spanked me too. And I remember when I stood up that night. You know you know what's coming if you've been around the things of God. You know, Stand at your feet if you want to surrender. As soon as I stood up, my whole life changed. Literally, my whole life changed and my whole generation changed. One message changed my whole I can that's not an exaggeration my whole life changed that night that song right I can see clearly now I never desired to be in ministry I thought preachers were strange especially Pentecostal ones they always were like bow your head and shut your eyes and I always kept my eyes open I was very rebellious you know And all the traveling preachers lived in RVs and had their kids sing when they couldn't even sing. Wrong. So I just, especially traveling, they're, they're strange people. And Brother Kruger always wanted everyone to pray in tongues when he came. I don't want to get under the pew every day. Brother Kruger's coming. Please, Lord Jesus, be sick. That didn't help, though, as a Pentecostal, because your parents would bring you to the meeting anyway. You get healed in the meeting, you know. People are like, I'm sorry I missed the meeting. I wasn't feeling well. My whole life changed. I wrote him a few years ago. I felt convicted that I never told this man how he changed my life. In the fulfillment of purpose, it's to put God on display. The fulfillment of the things that God has called you to do should be so unquestionably God that the world should take notice. And God, I'm going to close with this, God wants to trust a generation with secrets and mysteries that no one else can answer in this season. that will put God unquestionably on display. Last night I mentioned it. Some of you need to contend for anointings that every person you pray for gets healed. It's the will of God. But not just that. In the purpose that God has called you to be, seek to be someone who knows the mysteries of God in that area. The famous story, right, of George Washington Carver. He said, God, I want to know everything there is to know about you. He said, can't do that. Nobody can. But I can tell you everything you need to know about the peanut. So he gets wisdom and understanding for hundreds of products that come out of peanuts. Skin care, all these. Who knew from a peanut you could do that? God knows. Years ago, Cindy Jacobs had a program called God Knows. And that's just why we want to walk out this progression 
of the knowledge of God and allow the knowledge of God to define every area of your life. To be delivered of small cultural thinking. To be delivered of an American mindset. To be delivered of anything contrary to God and His ways. And what I've learned about God is He puts the gas down and never lets it go if you're willing to trust Him. I love, one of the things I love about my pastor, Al Bryce, he's 75, I believe, and he's still talking to me like he's, I'm going to do that, I got this, the Lord showed me this, I'm going to do this. I love that. This is not a man who's going to die poorly. This is not a man who's thinking like culture. I ever tell you what we're going to do this? Yeah, praise the Lord, we're going to do it all. Get around friends like that. Read two things and then look at John the third chapter. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus and I believe it expresses his heart. Jesus answered and said, Are you a teacher of Israel? Do not know these things. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify of what we've seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, what did he do? One of the primary ways he taught was through parables, we know. Parables are not real stories, we know. But he would tell stories to illustrate truths about an unseen kingdom that was supposed to run the world. So he had to use natural things people understood to display truths in the kingdom. And he's saying, I'm teaching you these stories, but you still don't get it. But then this expresses the passion of God. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he that has come down from heaven, which is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus was the first man since Adam to express God's original intent. And he expresses it this way. He goes, no one's ascended except he that descended, which is the Son of Man who's in heaven, but he's standing on the earth. He's modeling what Peter would put language to, that you've been made partakers of the divine nature. You want to see how that divine nature works? It works in the God kind of faith. The God kind of faith calls things be not as though they are because they will be. God operates like that so he gives you that same power. You're still a human. You still go, oh, I'm really weak. And he goes, I know, but I'm giving you divine power to overcome all things. But his heart is to share heavenly things that have all the implications of changing life here on the earth. That when you, when you display them, it is undeniably God. Unfortunately, sometimes I see unbelievers who track with this better than believers sometimes. I remember the first time I saw Steve Jobs. And I did this like presentation about an iPad. I go, who would need an iPad? I got a laptop. He saw something that could be valuable to life here on earth. And he's an unregenerated mind. How much more for the people of God? There are people in the body of Christ who've been working for other people for 20 years, yet they're supposed to be entrepreneurs. There are people who are entrepreneurs who are never supposed to be entrepreneurs. They're supposed to be planning churches because they have unique ways of seeing the world. But because probably somebody told them, no, that's not right, that's not how we do it, they've gone and done something else. Last verse, we read it last night. Let's read John 16. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Make it one of your life ambitions to be a person who God can share with you the weighty things of God that put God on display. And it's how you're stewarding what you have in your hand that determines your level of increase because this is what Jesus said. He would, he, if you listen to Jesus' words he spoke when he walked this earth, he would say things 
and he would just say, and he would just throw them out there to see if he could invite you into the experience. He would say, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Because to him who has, what do you say? More will be given. Why? Because there's this whole untapped realm of mystery that he wants to release upon the earth. And it's very practical. It's not this mystical thing sometimes. It's as practical as just hearing the word of the Lord for your neighbor. It's as practical as, as loving your boss when he's not very lovable. It's practical as blessing him. It's as practical as come 10 minutes early when you have trouble getting up in the morning. It's all these stewardships that open you up to hear truth that can change the world. What is a man who's going to change world history doing Moments before he steps into his, his, his crossroads moment, he is in a jail, stewarding the moment, interpreting dreams. And only God could bring that to pass. His job was not to bring it to pass. His job was simply to steward the moment. Thousands of people are going to be put on display, but there's thousands of others who will be unknown. But our greatest satisfaction should always be Him. It doesn't matter what level of significance and prominence God gives us. It matters if we will be faithful to do what He has asked us to do in this season. It is a Joshua 1 moment. After the death of Moses, of the Lord, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over the Jordan, you and all the people to this land, to the land I'm giving you, to the children of Israel. The Lord says, there is land. There is a place that my people have yet to inherit. There is a deep cry, says the Lord, in my heart. There is a deep cry for my people to cross over over by the grace of God in their weakness to enter into a place of promise, a place of provision. But it can only come through the proper positioning of my people's heart. And so the Lord says, I've gathered you, you here at the head of the year, at the beginning when the calendar ticks and, and tells us of a new beginning. Hey, shika aramoho shoyo otonomoyo this is, the Lord says, the beginning of a new era for my people. If my people will receive it, it's the beginning of a new era. Even as there was a death of one of my servants, there was an emerging of a new servant who would take the people of God where they had never been before. There is an emerging grace upon the leaders of God in the earth to take the people of God to places they have not been before. 2022, says the Lord, is a time where I want to begin to take my people where they have not been before. So the Lord says, grieve the previous season and let it go. Grieve the challenge, grieve the trauma, and lay it at the feet of my cross. For there is now an advancing spirit a taking spirit, a spirit of those same spies who said we're well able to go up and possess the land. And so the Lord says to his people, you are well able to go up and possess the land. You're well able to do everything I've called you to do. For your job is to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. And the Lord says there is a hammer of fire. There's a hammer of justice. There's a hammer of righteousness. There's a hammer of truth now coming to the Western church, particularly America. Make no mistake about it. This is a time of cleansing. This is a time of purity. This is a time of breakthrough. But you must have an open and a positioned heart. You must be pliable to the purposes of God. You must be properly aligned in your relationships with me, with each other to enter into this place. For that which I have to do must be done corporately. For the Lord says it is time for the corporate man to arise in the earth as never before. It is time for the corporate man to arise. 
The corporate man, the honor for the individual person next to you, the honor for the men and women in the pulpit, the honor must define my people. Honor, truth, and justice must define my people. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit in this nation. I see like this, this beautiful ladle. I don't know how else to describe it. And it's like dumping fresh oil and glory and fire right on the middle of the United States. And it's going to the East Coast, to the West Coast, in the middle of the nation. I will pour out, says the Lord, something unique and strange that will connect to previous seasons, but it will be unique to this season. And I am, says the Lord, I am releasing a unique spirit of wisdom and revelation on my people. Wisdom to understand the time and the seasons in which you live in. Wisdom to discern both good and evil. Wisdom to discern the words to speak. Did I not say, do not fear that day? For I would give you the words, and I will give you the words in this day. So the Lord says, it is a new day. It is a new day. It is a day of increase. It is a day of encounter. It is a day that I mark you with loving kindness for purpose in God. It is a day that I mark you with loving purpose in God. It is a day that I mark you with loving purpose in God. And I'm breaking today, says the Lord. I'm breaking confusion. I'm breaking misunderstanding. I'm breaking walls. Be free today to become everything I've intended you to become. Be free to explore my heart. Be free to explore my goodness. Be free to find the joy of your salvation. 2022. I'm going to restore the joy of my salvation and I'm going to increase joy for those who have abided in goodness, abided in peace. I'm going to increase that joy as never before. And I'm breaking today, says the Lord, victimization, victim thinking, that which has held my people back. There is, I don't know why I see it, but in this auditorium, I see this crack right in the middle. And it's like from underneath the ground. Like there's, a, there's like fire and like a volcano underneath this ground. The Lord says this, oh, this is holy ground. And this is a healing of the ground here today. For I set apart this land. I set apart this land, even many decades ago, for purpose. And I will fulfill my word over this land. I will fulfill the prayers of people of yesteryear, and I'll fulfill the prayers of the people of this current generation to make this room a place of habitation. 